sometimes I dare not speak. Those, some of those songs capture the words so eloquently, don't they? But um, let me stand on more certain ground. Let's read before I talk a little more on this passage. So open, if you will, with you, your Bibles in front of you, or however you're able to do that. And if you not and would like to, raise a hand. Someone can run to the back and get a Bible, but most of them seem to be tucked under seats. We're in John, so John's Gospel. So this is the disciple that followed Jesus around and saw firsthand what he was doing, and then after the event was able to write it down. So we get this wonderful mixture of someone who was there at the moment, knowing exactly what happened, but also being able to offer a little bit of commentary about now he understands after it's all played out. So we're in chapter 12 and verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. We pray a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that brings it alive to us today. We pray that you would help us as we think about these things. Father, control the words that come out of my lips, and I pray that they would only work to help us understand these words better, to un- see our Lord Jesus more clearly, be touched by him, and live differently as a result. For his glory, I pray. Amen. Okay, so some of the central themes we're going to be looking at this morning as we dig into this passage are glorifying and being glorified. And a key picture we're given is this seed that falls to the ground and then produces harvest. Um, I've introduced this theme of black and white and placed a real question mark over it. I'll try not to get too carried away with my themes or ideas, but It'll structure us. So you know what I'm getting to the end. We've got three ways of looking at black and white on top of having looked at all those Dulux colours and whites that we've got. The first one starts with degrees of light. I'll, I'll rely on you, Rod, I think. I think. So shades of white. Verse 20. 
Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Okay, so we're introduced to some Greeks here. Now, what the Jewish audience would have understood by that at the time was that these are outsiders. These are people who are different to us. They're Gentiles. It's interesting to reach for our equivalent, isn't it? But um, they were looking at northerners. We, you English people in the south often look up at northerners differently or people certainly who play on a different team in the Six Nations as different. But happily here in this audience, we are more diverse than that, aren't we? Wonderfully. There's a joke, isn't there? Um, has anyone heard about the Welshman who's found on a desert island? He's marooned on a desert island and they find him with three buildings. They say, why three buildings? And he says... Well, that's my house, that's the chapel I go to, and that's the chapel I don't go to. <laughs> I mean, that's comical, isn't it? But comedy is truth dancing, and we see that truth all too often, don't we, with the rise of nationalism and what's going on in the Middle East. As humans, we define ourselves more easily by what we're not, and we are not them, we are not like them, and we put them at a distance from ourselves. Interestingly then, these Greeks in the story reach out to Philip from Bethsaida. Now Philip is a Greek name. Bethsaida is up in the north, near to where more of the Greeks are. They seem to be naturally gravitating to someone who is more familiar while they're in Jerusalem, in uncomfortable territory. Like attracts like. And that's quite a natural process, isn't it? I think we probably recognise that in some of the um, social interactions we have. We hear people say, oh, I can talk to them. I bumped into kind of friends as, just as I walked in, neighbours of ours, and they were surprised that I was walking with them. I said, are you going down to get more drink early? I said, no, I've got a sermon in my hand. I'm going to have to preach at the Baptist church. There are people we make natural connections with. They didn't expect me to be going and going to church, let alone preaching. But there are other ways that we find common ground aren't we, with people we spend time with. In this verse, we're told these Greeks are among those who went up to the festival. So they're among Jews, God's people. They are going up to the festival and they are going to worship. They seem to be taking steps towards Jesus. They're not so distant, not so far away from God and God's people. There are degrees of closeness to Jesus and his disciples. We're in a period of Lent looking forward to Easter. There'll be plenty of people we spend time with who will be going without chocolate perhaps this week and then in a few weeks' time be eating lots of chocolate eggs. You know, these are marks of the festival we celebrate. And okay, we might feel we're closer to the real meaning of Easter, but there's a sense in which we're among a lot of people who are entering into the festival, joining with some of these activities. Perhaps people are a lot closer to Jesus, a lot closer to us, a lot closer to the truth than the labels or the prejudices we hold might imply. I think this time of year, festivals, recognising common ground, it's all opportunities, isn't it, for us to bond and connect with people who are a very long way from stepping through the door here on a Sunday morning. So they're among the people going up to worship. And then the closest step we've got is that line we've already underlined. They ask Philip, we would like to see Jesus. Don't we long for those conversations, those friendships we've got, some of the people we spend time with, maybe members in our family, for them to be so drawn or interested or get that close that they're asking us to see Jesus to ask us for introductions because that's what we're asked to be available to in, in, as disciples. So they might be seeing Greeks as different, but Jesus 
recognizes the significance of the Greeks being there as a positive thing. He recognizes the significance. Them, Greeks, this is all part of God's salvation history. We might draw the line and label people as other or different. Jesus recognizes them as a a sign of the kingdom, of a signal of things coming together. The other um, degrees of shade I think we see here is um, degrees of belief. So we're skipping down to verse 28, 29. This is at the point when this um, voice comes down from heaven. I was surprised. I, I, I was familiar with the voice that we have at Jesus' baptism. Forgive me that to have missed this. This is another moment where you've got a voice coming from heaven. God is speaking audibly and directly and about Jesus in direct response to this Jesus of Nazareth, this wandering carpent, ex-carpenter rabbi claiming to be the Son of God and praying to God. And there's a voice from heaven. What a... Anyway, that's by the way. Anyway, so there's this, there's this moment. And there's a crowd there that heard and thought it had thundered. There are others there that said an angel had spoken. Jesus recognizes the voice from God and the purpose. This voice is for your benefit. And it means now is the time for judgment. So there are degrees of understanding. Like when we sit, um, we gather together, different ones of us might hear different things or kind of learn new lessons. Whenever we gather, whenever we are a group of people, there are degrees of feeling belonging, there are degrees of belonging, there are degrees of understanding, believing. Okay. Number two, another way of seeing black and white is, can we move on the slide? Have we got black and white? Oh, right, okay. Is this idea of black and white, a starker contrast. And the picture Jesus gives us is this kernel of grain. So to help us see this picture better, what better way of seeing a picture in modern language, because we're not as familiar as David and other people are maybe of how things work in the agricultural world. Let's see a time-lapse video. Hmm. It's where your New Year starts, David, is it? This is a picture of Easter, isn't it? This is new life from death. What a wonderful picture. I'm hoping it's going to help us understand this next idea of black and white, more stark themes, live or die, love or hate. Because we've got this picture of a grain or seed that looks dead, the appearance of death. And yet we know what grows from that shows that there is real life and life with the potential to be far more abundant than what it is on its own. It feels hard, isn't it, to read, you must hate your life. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I think the two things are helping me understand this better. One is that distinction of my life and how sometimes when we're wrong about our attitude to life, we're selfish in our motivations, serving our own purposes, going our own way, particularly if it's in rebellion to God's right way. And that's the opposite of living for God in service of Jesus and service of other people, a life of love, generosity. I'm not important, others are more important. The other thing that's helped me understand it better is that it might be used as relative terms, that the hate um, is to show how much we love. We are being asked, not so much to hate any of the good things about life generally, but we're being asked to so love real life, life 
in Jesus and all that promises that it is in stark contrast to our feelings for this world, for this life in this world. And I find myself reaching for another picture, and that's of marriage. I'm very aware that when I took my marriage vows, part of what I had to promise was to forsake all others. And that is a measure of my devotion, faithfulness, unequaled love for this woman, my wife. There's no disparity you know, about other women, but this is an expression of how much I love this woman. I will forsake all others. When we're committed to one thing, it's natural to forsake the opposite. All the trappings that appear to be life, as this world defines it, uh, you know, is. I think what we've got here is a symbolic death. The seed falling to the ground is the life we're to give up, lose our grip on. That's our old shape. What this life looks like on the outside, what this world suggests our life should look like, what Instagram dictates we should look like, what our pension brokers tell us our savings plan should look like. The life of ease and comfort and luxury that the adverts tell us is what we're aiming for, what will satisfy, that's not real life. And that's the life we're being asked to allow to fall to the ground. Jesus is principally here talking about himself as the colonel, but he is talking to his disciples and it's the business of disciples to follow their rabbi in practice as well as in teaching to follow him, behave like him. So first and foremost, we want to be admiring the kind of death that Jesus took on and appreciate the benefits we reap, the growth of the kingdom ever since, those years of global reach, that harvest field of, of wheat. But secondly, there is a sense in which if we are sold on those returns, what comes of that? We are committed to the investment. We need to put a seed in the ground before we can expect a bountiful harvest. Jim Elliot said, isn't it? It's no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. Definition of this life, we can't hold on to it forever. It's not satisfying us. That's a fair trade, isn't it? Or it's a good investment to give that up in the hope of the eternal life that promises abundance forever. Verse 27, let's not make any mistake. It wasn't easy for Jesus. His soul is troubled, but his mind is made up. This is a hard path, but he recognizes the sole reason he came. In that moment of trouble, he reaches out to his father, glorify your name. This is the model we're following. Our Savior knew his purpose, knew his destiny, knew the hardship it would take to get him there, but his priority was his Father's glory. My soul is troubled. I couldn't help read that probably the fifth or sixth time without being reminded of do not let your hearts be troubled. Those of you who got the Bibles open, if you flick forward to chapter 14, is there in verse 1 and verse 27 later on. It's just a reminder that Jesus faced that trouble so that he could be saying to us, do not be troubled. He was prepared to take on what troubles us to do away with that. Okay, three of third, another way of looking at black and white, I hope. Kingdom negatives. Okay, is anyone too young to not recognize what we've got there at the bottom? Before we had digital cameras, you'd have to take the film out of the back of your camera and get it developed. And when the photos came back, you would have a negative like that. And we, those of us who are familiar with it know that a negative, in a negative, what appears to be black is actually white. 
from what appears to be white is actually black. Not everything is as it appears. Or at this point, not everything that's about to happen will be, is as it will appear to be. Jesus is talking to his disciples before he's embarking on this passage to death. Now, I feel like I've um, skipped over a bit. I stick with it. I'll stick with it. I'll come back if I haven't covered it in here. But on the next slide, I've got a table. So I'm hoping it's going to help because we're now down at verses verse thirty, yeah, thirty-one. If it doesn't help, I'll talk you through it. This is about where, how something appears is very, sorry, is very different to what the reality of the situation is. So this is Jesus with the benefit of looking forward. We've got the look, benefit of looking back, haven't we? We knew how this played out. We've got some idea of what went on at the crucifixion. Jesus is saying this ahead of time. T- and it gives us the confidence that, one, he was deliberate going into it, but also he knew it's kind of meaning what was really going on there, despite how it appeared. And he's offering that reassurance to his disciples, isn't it? Our verse 33 at the end, John tells us, Jesus said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is Jesus looking ahead to the path that lies ahead. Um, And this, what we're about to go through, is his kind of commentary on it. So now is, verse 31, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to himself. That's how Jesus describes what's about to happen, even though the appearance of it might have been very different. In fact, contrary, or the very opposite. He's been lifted up. So Jesus is looking ahead to the crucifixion. That appeared to be a curse. That appeared to be defeat. But Jesus knows that will be the path of glory and honour. He describes a time coming when it appears evil will be in the driving seat. But in reality, evil will be being driven out. The prince of this world will be being driven out. It will appear the world's judgment on Jesus is prevailing. He was condemned as a criminal, His enemies appear to have taken control. But we know that the reality was God's necessary judgment on the world's sin that was voluntarily borne by Jesus. The demands of Satan, the prince of this world, for justice on sinners was borne away by Jesus himself. So the prince of this world had no further claim driven out he's got no business here anymore this is the meeting point of wrath and justice god was judging the world and at the same time saving the sinners i'd love to spend more time talking about that if that hasn't ever been properly understood Let's talk afterwards. But it's clear that... Okay, there's also a drawing in going on here. That's the other thing that we see in these verses. While it appears that Jesus is lifted up on that cross was appeared to be him being deserted and abandoned, betrayed, disowned, forsaken, it was in actual fact drawing all people to himself. This wasn't a tragic accident. This had purpose. And rather than Jesus being driven out, people were being drawn towards him. The appearance of things going down was actually the route to things going up. Jesus had to come down to this earth, down to the depths of death and hell, as a route to victory and being glorified. You know, beyond that, there was a vindication that happened in the resurrection, and after that ascension into heaven, there was a lifting higher and higher. And 
beyond where we are now, there will be that final kind of consummation in salvation history, that wedding day feast when the whole of creation will see how high he's exalted. But that's what's going on. And it's not just that, it's not just Jesus being lifted up to that height. But in him coming down to his people, taking on humanity, being our champion, with him he lifts us up on our way. And that's our way to turn this half-life into a glorious life. Following the way of our saviour is a way that involves forsaking this life only to secure a future and a security that is far greater. These are big themes, aren't they? And I'm glad of hymns that capture it probably more eloquently than me. Um, it's universal. This is a cosmic event where Jesus is doing something for all of humanity, all of creation, but it's also very personal. And it takes that kind of registration, that registering that and and signing up to it, following Jesus in that. And it turns on its head this business of dying that way when we know that that's a route to life. I'm going to end with um, kind of a, a memory I've got. Um, and it was the funeral of my grandparents. But I am taken to a hill in Margam, South Wales, that overlooks a coastal plain and the valleys that were beautiful. The industry is since damaged and the steelworks sit there, but that was where my grandfathers worked out their working life and served the Lord in the communities that worked there. there there's, a, there's a graveyard there, and I had the privilege of, alongside three of my brothers, carrying a coffin and lowering it into the ground there in Margam. And then... Ten years later, taking my grandfather the same way, in a coffin, and lowering him in. And it was just that distinct feeling at the time that this isn't a burying, this is a planting. My gramps followed his Lord Jesus, and we were planting him in the hope that that seed, when it falls into the ground, carries a greater life that will grow and flourish into greater abundance, and we will see that on Judgment Day. Death will prove to be the way to eternal life. Falling to the ground will be the way to an abundant life. And we can look forward to abundance breaking out from seed shells that we occupy now to a glorious light of eternity dawning, perhaps by degrees, little by little, darker to lighter and as our understanding and the understanding of those around us that we pray for but that dawn is coming it will grow slowly but there will be something very certain as Jesus returns and does that work in us and through us until then okay we've got our last hymn that will hopefully capture some of that, but I'm just going to read over that last verse so that we're reading, we're left with John's words and not mine. Jesus said, this voice from heaven, from God, was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. All I once held dear, knowing you, Jesus. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services? at our physical location. All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.